and uh, many are familiar with various phrases of uh, people uh, focusing on the bridge between uh, Wall Street and Main Street. Uh, people are deeply troubled and concerned about excesses in the corporate uh, realm in terms of irresponsibility and many claim as well uh, unaccountability. Uh, we're talking about things that have to do with mortgages, with foreclosures, uh, with debts, with finance, uh, with investment, uh, uh, with options, uh, with deposits, uh, with T-bills, with, with capital markets, uh, with loans, with indebtedness, uh, with stimuli and stimulus and with bailouts and capital uh, liquidity and insolvency and many other phenomena that are troubling in a way that most here have not seen in their adult uh, lifetimes. Uh, we are also focusing on a particular uh, bridge relationship uh, between the United States and its uh, relations with the Arab countries, the Middle East, and the Islamic uh, world. On one hand, in the relationship of the Arab countries, the Middle East, and the Islamic world uh, with the United States on the other. Uh, rather than see this in a polarized concept or politicized uh, concept, uh, we're all in this uh, together. Uh, we're in the same boat. Uh, the boat may be leaky at this time, uh, but it's salv salvageable and repairable, but not by accident and not by coincidence. We're talking about a region and a relationship uh, that has to do with uh, two kinds of oil, turmoil, <coughs> and that other kind. Uh, but it's one that's lacing, lace, uh, laced and uh, uh, ridden uh, with all kinds of uh, challenges and needs and concerns on both sides, which will be addressed uh, this morning. Here we are to examine the question of what role, if any, and if any, to what extent uh, does Islamic finance have in terms of helping the present uh, economic uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we are dealing here with a number of terms and concepts that for most Americans are foreign. I just listed about 16 uh, words and concepts and phenomena and factors and forces uh, that affect Americans. Uh, but how can we address our needs and concerns and objectives in these regards if we don't have a minimal uh, comprehension of other concepts, forces, and factors, for example, the Holy Quran, for example, Sharia, for example, the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, the notion of consultation uh, in terms of shura, the notion of consensus in terms of ijma'a, uh, the notions of chaos in terms of analogy, the notions of ummah in terms of the uh, motherhood and the brotherhood and the sisterhood of the Islamic faithful, in terms of fatwa or legal opinions, in terms of rubba, in terms of interest, in terms of uh, fiqh, in terms of Islamic jurisprudence, in terms of suk and sukuk with respect to, to bonds. Uh, we can say that these are too foreign, it's difficult to pronounce them, difficult to even to spell them, uh, difficult to comprehend them. Uh, but this would be a cop-out. Uh, we need to have an elemental understanding of this, just as when people from other countries, and especially the Arab countries, the Middle East and the Islamic world come to the United States, we expect, and some indeed demand, uh, that they be cognizant of America's values, America's traditions, America's moral principles, America's religious uh, beliefs, and be sensitive to and appreciative of these phenomena. And we get quite angry and put off uh, uh, when this is not displayed. Well, if the golden rule means anything in terms of do unto others as one would have one do, uh, do to oneself, uh, then the other side of the coin is that we have no choice. Uh, inactivity is not an option here in terms of uh, wanting to understand, needing to understand these phenomena, which our speakers will help us address uh, this morning. We're talking at the end of the day of a people who constitute 1.3 billion Muslims. This is a quarter of humanity. 
We're talking about a region that is the crucible of culture for the Western world, a region that was intricately and extensively involved in the development of capitalism, something of which almost no Americans, most Americans, are, are, are completely unaware. We're talking about the crossroads of three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. We're talking about the anvil of antiquity. We're talking about the source of sunshine on the classical world. We're talking about the epicenter of prayer and pilgrimage and faith and spiritual devotion, uh, sometimes on various days, certainly around the weekend, constituting the traffic jam of the devout. We're talking about a region that affects everyone in this room in terms of the bequeathed uh, values and principles uh, by which we have built our institutions and which uh, we as individuals uh, try as best we can to conduct our lives. Now we have the questions uh, related to Islamic finance because many people are critical, many people are, are suspect, many people are hostile, and many people count themselves amongst the adversaries and enemies of, of Muslims. And amongst the questions uh, people ask, or uh, is the notion of uh, profit and risk sharing real or is it just notional? Is it verifiable or is it fictional? Is it but religiosity wrapped in the raiment of rhetoric to make one feel more pious uh, when in fact, say the critics and the suspect, it merely masks monetary motivations that under close examination are uncannily similar to financial transactions with which many are more familiar. These are legitimate questions, and these are amongst the questions that our speakers today uh, will address. We have Sheikh Yus uh, Yus Talal Yusuf uh, de Lorenzo, uh, who is the chief uh, Sharia officer uh, of uh, Sharia capital, and he is a prodigious uh, writer, scholar, researcher, speaker, and consultant, and advisors on these issues, including uh, Sharia compliance. He's the author of the Compendium, compendium of Legal Opinions uh, uh, on the Operations of Islamic Banks. He's also been appointed by the Asian Development Bank and the Islamic Development Bank in Jeddah to the International Financial Services uh, Board. Uh, these two speakers are amongst 250 uh, reported alleged uh, specialists in Islamic finance and Sharia uh, compliance uh, demands and, and needs. Uh, however, if this conference was comprised of all 250 and 248 didn't show up, these two, I submit, uh, would cover for the other 248. Uh, they are, uh, in terms of a situation in a year where people are concerned with unemployment, these are two of the least unemployed people on the planet. <laughs> Sheikh Yusuf. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you who have taken the time to come here this morning and listen to us. And thank you very much, Dr. Anthony, for that incredible introduction. Um, I, I can easily understand through your eloquence and facility with the English language how it is that you've come to love the Arabic language. Um, it, it, it's very clear from your rhetoric, and I, I appreciate it very much. I have some slides here, and if I can get them to work, or maybe someone can help me. Uh, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> okay. Uh, That one. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Good. Bismillah. Um, I'm here to talk about Islamic finance. Uh, I should explain in the beginning that Islamic finance goes back a long way. Um, I'm really here to talk about modern Islamic finance. There's obviously a difference. Um, nonetheless, 
the roots of modern Islamic finance are obviously uh, lie with the tradition, the traditional practice of Islam and business. And it, it's an interesting uh, history, actually, uh, and, and, uh, from the perspective of, of the religion and its attitudes towards business, trade, and commerce, contrary to um, Contrary to popular con the, the popular conception that Islam was spread by the sword, it was spread by business and commerce. It was spread by trade. It was spread through partnerships where people shared and did things together and ultimately profited together. That's what brought, brought people to Muslims and eventually to Islam. So I, uh, from my name, you can uh, perhaps uh, deduce that I'm a convert to, to Islam myself. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those true believers. Uh, I especially believe in the Islamic financial system. I think it has a great deal to offer to everyone. And while I, I'm not really happy about the present global crisis, um, I can say that, well, it gives me an opportunity to talk about some ideas which six months or a year ago would, would have fallen on deaf ears. Um, but in fact, the successes of uh, Islamic finance uh, through the crisis point to some fundamental and very important concepts. And we'll talk about those today. But the first slide has, uh, I, I want to point out, uh, I, I, received, uh, I, I received lots of manuscripts from people writing on subjects having to do with Islamic finance. I received one from a quantitative analyst in, Ger in Germany. Uh, the first line, the first sentence in the book that he sent to me was this sentence. And it was the best sentence in the book. The rest was about derivatives and I don't know what and uh, probably, uh, but in any case, I brought you this this morning because it points, it says unique. Uh, it, it, what's, what jumped out at me <clears throat> from the page was the fact that, yes, I've been in this, <clears throat> in this system for many years, um, but I never really thought of it as a unique system um, and one that's actually uh, in the same ballpark, let's say, as conventional finance. But indeed, today we find ourselves in that position. And um, we, we do because our system is predicated on our, our beliefs and on the way that we um, act and transact with people in society. Let's talk about the origins of Islamic finance, modern Islamic finance. God did not say, build me a bank like he said to Noah. <laughs> we have to work from principles, no direct commandments. Um, and so, it's been an interesting exercise, but this is much the same in every situation uh, that Muslims find themselves in <clears throat> throughout the ages. In other words, we find ourselves in different societies and different geographies, and it's our responsibility <coughs> as Muslims and certainly as jurists to make sense of, of, of our situation in the world in the light of the revelation that we received from Allah through the Quran and through the Prophet Muhammad So our responsibility is to make sense of those things and to, bring, to give them relevance and bring them to our own circumstances and surroundings and make them work, whether these are institutions that have to do with charity, with finance, with law, <coughs> with education, or whatever the case. And that's my second point, and that is that um, I feel that modern Islamic finance really grew out of the post-World War II uh, independence movements, many of which were obviously polit political in nature. Nonetheless, nonetheless, a lot of soul searching was going on uh, amongst the Muslim peoples of the world. And a part of that soul searching was uh, an attempt to reclaim their own understanding of the world through their own institutions. So again, whether they were educational, political, legal, charitable, financial, 
everyone started thinking in those terms. What is it that really makes us who we are? <coughs> Islamic finance, from that perspective again, is not a competing ism. Um, Muslims are, are, have always accepted their place in the world. We are a part of the world. We, we want to be a part of the, the community of, 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 of the sons and daughters of Adam. We don't consider ourselves a nation apart by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so we, when we think in, or, or started thinking about our financial institutions, we didn't think about setting up an alternative something or other system over here, but no. We, we looked at the mainstream and thought, well, how can, we, how can we fit in? How can we help out? How can we help ourselves out? How can we make ourselves heard? And how can we make, make progress? for our people. Um, part of this exercise has to do with, with the Sharia. My background is in Sharia studies. Sharia is essentially a principles-based system of making sense of the universe as, uh, a, 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 and society from the perspective of the, of the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet, alayhi salam. Jurists for uh, uh, the last <clears throat> 1,400 years have been um, uh, employed in the, in the exercise of, of attempting to make sense of their surroundings. And part of the exercise nowadays, uh, and an important one, is making sense of finance. Let's look at some of the basics of Islamic finance. Um, to begin with, everyone knows that there's a prohibition against interest. That's what Islamic finance is. And that's the impression that a lot of people have. Well, it's true. Islamic finance does prohibit interest, but there's something deeper to that. And to begin with, the, the fundamental principle is that money is a measure of value. You don't use money. Uh, I read a really interesting sentence recently. You, you, the, 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 the current banking system uses lending to earn money. In other words, every time someone opens an, an account in a bank, the, there, there's this process and, and more money is, is, is added to the system. It's essentially money generated from lending. Um, Islamic finance says no. Money is really a measure of value. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a commodity. Uh, when you trade money, you trade it at par. You exchange it at par. You don't profit from it because money is in and of itself intrinsically without value. We endow it with value. Um, so it's not a commodity. It's not to be traded. It, it is a measure of value. And as such, it cannot, in cyberspace or elsewhere, uh, generate more and more of, 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 of money. And this is a problem that, um, that, that, that has come to light, uh, that, that we've had to confront seriously recently. Likewise, debt, the question of debt, the whole credit crunch, uh, debt crisis of the world presently, comes about why? Because people made a living out of trading debt. Well, from our perspective, debt is a, is a responsibility. Um, the, 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 when you lend money, you do so not as a business activity, but out of charity. Um, and, and so to profit from debt, is, it just doesn't make sense from a Sharia perspective. And so debt is, is another one of the fundamental differences uh, between conventional finance and Islamic finance. The aim of finance is to create stuff that's real, that, we, that people can use, whether they're services or goods or whatever the case may be. Um, the creation of, 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 of uh, castles in the sand uh, is, is not what we're about. Um, we, we aim at, at, at having companies and investments that actually perform and do things for society. Another important point from here is that, is that it, it, Islamic finance does not encourage, obviously, the lender-borrower relationship. Instead, it encourages a partnership kind of participatory finance. That sort of relationship is, is, is the one that's deemed most beneficial to society. And it ends up 
in, in, in finance where people actually have skin in the game. Now it's true that, 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 that banks who, which lend out money, obviously they have, they're lending out their capital. But the point is that that is essentially disinterested capital. They're looking at credit ratings. They're not looking at the end user or the end enterprise. It's, it's not a consideration really. The, the difference here is that participatory finance where you have a partnership and a real interest in what's going on in the enterprise, that encourages all kinds of good things, accountability, transparency, and all of the things that add up to good business. And of course, risk and reward sharing. So we've, we've, we've over the last 30, 40 years, we've, we've been able to establish an alternative to conventional finance. We operate in the same arena, but we do things a little bit differently. Uh, we cooperate with one another uh, we, 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 on a regular basis, but we do have a little bit of a different system for ourselves. So to begin with, we don't lend money. Islamic banks do not lend money. Yes, they encourage participatory finance. And there's a lot of different ways that this can come about. Perhaps Michael will talk about some of the things on the ground that we're doing. Um, what about the NIM, the, the net interest margin? Well, 30 years ago when the Islamic banks opened their doors, <clears throat> people sort of laughed. How can you have a bank if you're not going to take money in at one rate and lend it out at a higher rate and profit from the difference? That's what a bank does. That's the business bank of a model, uh, the business model of a bank. Well, we've, we've managed to establish that, in fact, you can do business in a, in a little bit of a different way. Um, likewise, what about Islamic investment funds? Everybody knows that an investment fund, in order to be sound, needs to be balanced. And the way that you balance an investment fund is that you have a little bit of bonds over here, a little bit of debt, and you have a little bit of equity over here, the stock side. Well, what about an Islamic portfolio if you can't you can't hold T-bills, you can't hold bonds. What are you going to do to balance your portfolio? Well, we've, we've, we've come up with a number of innovative answers to that as well. Islamic treasuries do not invest in T-bills, CDs, or money markets. Obviously, the, the uh, Islamic banks have um, you know, a mandate. It's very clear, and it's enforced by their Sharia boards, that they're not going to lend money. <clears throat> they're not going to borrow money. They're not going to have anything to do with debt. So how do, they, how do they live in a world where regulators insist that it's a matter of uh, fiscal responsibility that your treasury should hold so much cash, so much debt, <clears throat> so much this, so much that, T-bills and the overnight, the liquidity management, again, is, is, is a big problem. Nonetheless, Islamic banks and financial institutions have found innovative answers to all of these. How do we make it work? Well, the interesting thing about it is that we make it work by cooperating with anyone who's willing to cooperate with us. Um, we've found ally allies in the international law firms, people like uh, Michael McMillan, my colleague here. Uh, we've found allies in the banks of the world who see an opportunity in a market that's continuing to expand. And uh, we, we have found uh, a number of, of, uh, 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 of central banks and, uh, in, in, throughout the Muslim world and elsewhere who are willing to accommodate the way that the special way that we do business. Um, what we've done is, yes, we've gone back to fundamentals, to first principles, uh, the old classical models of transacting that we've, uh, fr from, the, from the early centuries of Islam, have actually proved to be uh, very sound building blocks for modern transactions. Um, Michael and I wrote a paper on the subject a few years ago. Uh, but essentially, uh, good business is good business, and fundamentals are always going to be the same. Uh, it's just that Islamic finance insists on a, on a degree of prudence that may be um, is, is more than the ordinary, but it may be needed. Um, 
So we've adapted the classical contractual models uh, to fit the modern markets of the world, and we've converted a number of conventional products. Uh, right here in Washington, for example, um, I worked on a project a few years ago to uh, offer uh, home finance, home financing to uh, Muslim families. And uh, the, the, uh, at first it was thought, you know, impossible to come up with, with a, 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 an alternative to a conventional mortgage. How can you have a, you know, how can you finance something as big as a home with, with, with Islamic finance? Um, there were a, a number of very small companies um, operating regionally, which uh, had very, very stringent sort of uh, requirements. You had to put 40 or 50 or 60 percent down. Uh, you had to wait in line for six or eight months or a year uh, to get your, uh, your, your home financing. Um, now we've been successful in developing a system which fits seam seamlessly into the, into the mainstream. We work with uh, uh, Freddie Mac and Sally May uh, to provide uh, financing for Muslims all over the country. And there are now several of these operations, not only in the U.S., but in Saudi Arabia, in, in Pakistan, in Malaysia, in the U.K., uh, and elsewhere. Um, and, and I, I, I it, and the really interesting thing is that from a Sharia perspective, when we were first approached uh, with this particular problem or product, and, and this is repeated many times over is why I mention it, from a Sharia perspective, we had, we suggested, the Sharia scholars, suggested three or four different solutions. We thought that we could use uh, a classical murabaha. We thought that we could use an ijara wa qtina. We thought that we could use uh, musharaka. We, there, were, there were these models in front of us. Ultimately, what decided uh, the, the model that we went with were, were considerations outside Sharia, considerations of taxation, uh, of, of the bottom line, profitability, and so on. Uh, in the UK, a similar story. Well, d d yeah, suffice it to say that th these are just different models, uh, 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 tr old transactional models that, that we use uh, uh, f on a daily basis. Uh, some of them have to do with uh, Murabah has a markup, uh, an Ijara Waqtina is, is a lease to purchase agreement, and a Musharaka is a partnership, an equity partnership where one partner buys the other one out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a plug in here. There's a company in New York called the Light Bulb Press, and they've developed a book called A Muslim's Guide to Home Finance. You, you can find all the models there. Uh, Sharia supervision is, is, is uh, obviously an important part of all Sharia-based operations. Um, Islamic finance is essentially Sharia-compliant finance. Um, it, it, uh, it's finance that essentially complies with another, another regulator, a higher authority, let's say, as interpreted by Sharia boards. So when we do deals ar around the world, we, uh, whatever the jurisdiction is, we, we have to comply with the wishes of the investors, of the business people. We comply with the wishes of the regulators, and we add a third one here, and that's compliance with the Sharia. Um, I won't go into the details there. Um, this is a little bit of a timeline. Um, again, it began with post-World War II. Um, in, the, in, in the 50s and 60s, people talked about something called, well, they, at the time they called it Islamic finance, uh, pardon me, Islamic economics, iqtisaduna. Our, our economics was one of the earlier books. Several thinkers, and, and, and a lot of it was, was political in, in nature. Nonetheless, people began thinking about it. And I know that in 1955, in Tehran, uh, the, uh, the, there was a meeting of the regional uh, 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 central banks. And at that time, there was a special panel on Islamic economics. It's the first that I've been able to actually document and find. That was back in 1955. In any case, in the 70s, um, there was a, a significant uh, uh, impetus. Um, it, 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 in fact, in, in the, 
like I said, in the 50s and 60s and 70s were really a time of incubation. In other words, this was, a, as, a, was a, as a subject, was something that was discussed amongst academics, really, uh, at universities. And uh, people wrote books and pr made presentations, uh, did research papers, and so on and so forth. Um, finally, it led to the idea that, well, someone had the idea, well, we should put this into practice. Let's, let's see what we can do. And so a handful of banks opened up in the early 70s. Um, as you know, as you recall, I'm sure, the 70s represented a, a time of, uh, w w of great capital influx into the region, into the Middle East anyway. And part, a lot of that went into the, uh, into the early attempts at uh, uh, opening Islamic banks. Um, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, then in the 80s, more and more of these things began to open their doors. And let me backpedal a little bit. I, I'm sorry I'm a little scatterbrained, but uh, you'll have to bear with me. Uh, when Islamic banks first opened their doors, they were faced with, with major, major problems. Um, obviously, I, I alluded earlier, uh, they were operating on a, on a completely different business model. But uh, there's more to it. From a Sharia perspective, a deposit, and a bank is obviously a de deposit-taking institution, or most banks are, uh, a deposit, or a wadia, is um, one of what we call buyu al-amana, or one of the sales of trust. And buyu al-amana do not allow tasarruf. They do not allow you, the, 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 the trustee to dispose at his will or her will of whatever it is they're holding in trust. And so what is it, what do, you, what do you do with a bank that takes a deposit and then is prohibited from doing anything with that money except for holding it and then returning it from a conceptual perspective? And so that was um, just to illustrate and I, it, you know, some <coughs> of the fundamental problems that we had starting out with Islamic banks. Obviously, we found another way to take deposits. Um, but uh, the, 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 the 70s and the 80s uh, were uh, uh, a very steep learning curve, let's say, for Islamic banks and financial institutions around the world. There were uh, very few bankers in the world who were familiar with, uh, with Sharia and its principles, and there were very few Sharia scholars in the world who were familiar with banks and how they operated. And somehow the two had to come together in order to make a success of this, uh, of this enterprise. And when they did in the 90s, that's when things started to take off. Um, and so we, 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 we saw then uh, international banks opening Islamic windows uh, around the world, uh, structured products began to be offered, and a real watershed was the uh, launch of the Dow Jones Islamic Market Index, uh, singular, in 1999. Today there are over 70. Islamic indexes from Dow Jones alone. Otherwise, there's MSCI, there's Standard & Poor, there are um, Thomson Reuters, everybody's got an Islamic index now. Um, I, I, I'll skip over uh, the rest of the history. This is recent history, um, but suffice it to say that um, we've, we've made quite a bit of progress from those early days when we couldn't really figure out how to ca categorize the money that was coming into the doors. Uh, Islamic finance today is a <clears throat> multi-billion dollar industry. It's growing at a phenomenal rate. Uh, its practitioners are all over the world, and um, it's, it's a very exciting new industry. Um, one of the things that we developed was a hybrid to mimic the, in some ways, um, a bond. I mentioned earlier that obviously it, 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 a bond as a debt instrument, as one that carries interest, even a zero, zero coupon bond, it's a debt in instrument. All of that's prohibited. And so we developed something that met our needs and at the same time agreed with, with our principles and criteria. The first sukuk were, inter, uh, were uh, sovereign sukuk. Uh, I think the first one was, was issued by Malaysia probably in the, in the, uh, in the 90s. But the, the sukuk market really took off in 2002 or 2003 when AOFI, or the Auditing 
and accounting, uh, or organization of Islamic financial institutions, AAOIFI.org. AOFI is a standard setting body. When it set the standards for Sukuk in, 19, in, in 2003, the, uh, the floodgates opened, let's say, because then people understood how they worked and what they were. And so Sukuk began to be offered not only by sovereigns around the world, but by corporates. And um, today the market is, is thriving despite a little bit of a setback last year. Obviously, the, uh, the markets uh, for Sukuk uh, uh, are, 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 are subject to the same influences of, uh, that the capital markets around the world are subject to. And so there was a falling off last year, uh, credit being what it is. Uh, we, we don't know when, when that, uh, you know, when, when, when those will come back, but nonetheless, uh, it, it is a, a healthy new instrument that we've developed. Uh, it meets our needs, and it's doing quite well. Investment funds uh, of all sorts abound in Islamic finance. Uh, in the beginning, it's in the, when, when, when the banks first opened their doors, they had two investment options. One was real estate and the other one was commodities uh, because no one had figured out at that point exactly how what you, you go about uh, investing uh, in compliance with Sharia uh, in, in the stock markets, for example, or in leasing funds or, or in projects or whatever the case, private equity, whatever the case may be. Um, Nonetheless, the numbers uh, are, 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 um, are revealing. Uh, the, the industry uh, is certainly doing quite well. Uh, and these, uh, these numbers come from a, uh, an Ernst & Young study. In terms of performance, um, it, we, we've done quite well as, uh, as well. Um, the Dow Jones indices have grown. Um, an interesting thing about the Dow Jones indices, back in 2002, I guess it was, when Enron tanked and when WorldCom failed and when uh, Tyco and a couple of others, we delisted all of those companies from the Dow Jones Islamic Index about six to eight months before any of those failures showed up. And the reason that we did that was because they no longer complied with the criteria that we had established for investing. And if you go to their websites, Dow Jones or FTSE or any of the uh, index providers, you can, f you can see the, the details of the, of the criteria for investing. Uh, but it, but it's, it's interesting to see that. And here again, in, in recent uh, months, uh, Islamic investors and portfolios have held up reasonably well because our portfolios do not include companies like uh, AIG, for example, or, or Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns because we don't, we don't allow investments in banks or in insurance companies that uh, earn revenues from interest. Uh, the first Islamic hedge fund in in index was launched in Dubai in, in January. Um, today, indexes are all over the place. And the interesting thing is that many of our uh, Islamic funds, including one here in the U United States, have won awards for performance, for continued uh, success uh, over uh, a number of years. What about the credit crisis and Islamic finance? Um, first of all, could it happen in Islamic finance? Yes, it could. Quite honestly, it could. There are a lot of people uh, in Islamic finance today who are saying, uh, we have the better system, it's clear because those guys got creamed and we're still standing. That's, that's, that's really not the case. <coughs> we dodged the bullet in a sense, partially because Islamic finance is still young and small. Partially because, well, let's take young and small. What does that mean? The, there were, up until now, there have been no subprime home financings from Islamic finance providers in the United States. Now, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the United States, no. Why? Because those finance providers, those companies in the U.S., and there are five or six of them today, um, work closely with Freddie May and, and, and uh, with, with Freddie Mac and Sally May, 
and they only offer what's called conforming loans. They don't offer loans, they offer financings, all right? But in, in Freddie's term, it's a, it, it's, it's a loan. So those contra in other words, only the only financings offered by uh, Sharia compliant home finance companies in the U.S. are financings to people whose credit ratings and, and, and uh, financial status uh, is, 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 is above average. Not even average, above average. Uh, and the demographics of our community allow for them to be profitable with that situation. Now they're looking into the possibility of being able to finance people with, 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 with lower incomes. Uh, and eventually, who knows, they might get into it and will they offer jumbo loans? I don't know. That, that, that may be possible. Uh, can we do it from a Sharia perspective, offer jumbo loans? Yes, we can. Yeah. So it, 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 it may be possible, I, I mean, it, it may have been possible for some of the Islamic finance companies to, to have been caught up in the same sort of subprime crisis, but fortunately it didn't happen. Um, what about uh, CDOs? You know, again, another byproduct of, of or, or another factor in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the crisis. Could we have avoid, uh, could, you know, were we involved in those things? Not really, but it's to a degree, um, you, know, you, you can think in terms of sukuk and CDOs and possibly matching them. The, the kinds of assets that would be uh, uh, used for those uh, collateral debt obligations, uh, you know, we, that would be another question. So it, it's all in the details. So, I mean, were we caught up in that? No. Could we have been? Possibly. Derivatives? No. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we've not really developed a lot of derivatives as yet, uh, but people are working on them. Uh, I've seen a lot of proposals and actually a lot of projects recently uh, <coughs> to develop uh, derivative in instruments because obviously the management of risk is all important in finance. And uh, in a sense, Islamic banks and financial institutions have, you know, one hand tied behind their backs. And so the use of derivatives would, would certainly be beneficial. But obviously those derivatives would have to, um, would have to satisfy a lot of Sharia uh, criteria before they get passed. Um, but it is possible that some, some derivatives could come about. Likewise, the question of leverage. Uh, the big banks got creamed, the big funds got creamed because they, uh, they use the leverage uh, to the hilt. Uh, do Islamic funds do that? No, they don't. Um, but could they? Yes, to a degree. Uh, Sharia, uh, Sharia boards have uh, permitted leverage uh, in certain uh, circumstances and up to certain levels. I, I don't think that that, that that will really be a factor in the future, but nonetheless, it is a possibility. And what about Bernie Madoff? Bernie Madoff? Could Bernie Madoff happen in Islamic finance? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, everybody's, uh, we're all humans. We're all subject to the same temptations and, 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 and situations. Uh, but I really don't think so. Um, uh, it, it, we, we've, we've, we've seen some scandals in Islamic finance, um, notably in, in Egypt in the 80s, in, in Pakistan, in, uh, here and there, in the UK. There have been some little things. In, recently in Chicago, somebody ran away with a few million dollars, investors uh, in the name of Islam as well. These things happen. But the interesting thing about the Islamic financial institutions, the institutions that we've built, is that um, uh, I, I alluded earlier to the, uh, to the standards board. We have a standards board uh, for Sharia and auditing uh, and, and, and what we've done is we've built into our systems um, a great deal of transparency and a great deal of accountability. And above and beyond the conventional sorts, we have the Sharia accountability. Now, now I, as a Sharia scholar, have access or advisor to a number of funds around the world, have access through my computer to their portfolios. And I can see what they're trading and when and with whom. Um, so the Sharia boards, in addition, have this oversight function and capability 
which acts again as as a as a as, a, as another level of transparency and, a, and, a, and, a, and essentially a deterrent against repetition of Madoff. Are we vulnerable as a uh, as an industry? Um, yes, uh, the industry remains overexposed to real estate and to commodities. Uh, the London Metal Exchange loves Islamic finance, they absolutely love us. Billions of dollars across, that, across the ocean every year. Again, it's because we have one hand tied behind our back and for purposes of managing our liquidity, we go to those markets. Real estate was just a natural, we're overexposed to do real estate from the very beginning. So there is truly a, a lack of diversification in terms of uh, deployment of capital. Uh, there is a lack of tools for rich risk management. But people are working on these. Um, and likewise, there is an overdependence on conventional sources of credit. Many, many Islamic projects, uh, real estate deals, uh, will not work unless we have a partner in a conventional bank who's willing to play ball with us, who's willing to provide financing, upfront financing that we later process and, 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 and shape in our own way. But we are very much uh, uh, a part of, of, of the mainstream financial system and we need everyone's cooperation and we're therefore subject to the same sort of vicissitudes. Um, the opportunity presented to us by this particular crisis is that well, we have a chance to reflect. For a, a lot of Islamic financial institutions right now have a hold on investing. They've called in their cash, they're, they're, they're sitting and waiting. Um, it's, it's, it's an opportunity really for people to look at the industry and um, learn from our mistakes. It's also an opportunity for us to share with others our successes. Um, and we've had a few. I won't say we've had many, but we've had a few. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the bond markets of the world may trade in 10 minutes the total amount of sukuk that we can trade or produce in a year. Nonetheless, we've got something that's viable. We've developed an alternative. And when you look at the, you know, at, at the nuts and bolts of these instruments that we've developed, they're fundamentally a little bit more sound than the other products out there. And um, it would be uh, foolish of me probably to make the statement that, well, if the world had adopted the Islamic financial system, it would never find itself in this present crisis. But nonetheless, I think that we have a lot to offer in terms of uh, prudent business practices. Um, so it gives us a chance to think of our goals and, again, to emphasize um, to uh, you know, a world that has grown uh, insensitive to, to, to religious and moral values. Um, most people's attitudes about um, organized religions uh, are not, you know, not encouraging for, for people like ourselves in Islamic finance. But um, when we really think about it, we stop and think about it, no matter who we are, um, the, the values that our parents instilled in us, whether we got those values from our parents or whether we got them from school or from places of worship, our, our clergy, those are pretty much the same values and those are values that are shared by people around the world. And when we think about those values, gee, wouldn't it make sense to sort of have a, a, a global financial system that really paid some serious attention to those values? I mean, it, 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 why not think about these things? And especially when we have a, a, an example of a, of a working model that's an alternative, and it's, it's been pretty successful. And finally, what we need to do uh, for our future is to develop um, more people uh, to take part and, and carry this into the future. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Sheikh Yusuf. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony, and thank you to everybody at the council, um, doctors 
Mancino and Winship, wherever you might be, to Qatar Airways in particular, um, Oxford Business Group, and of course, Ronald Reagan Center. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Now, I'm, this is going to be hard on you guys with the camera. I'm going to pace because I'm not going <laughs> to stand here. Um, and hopefully, if you can't hear me as we go along, just let me know. Um, <coughs> just kind of as an overview, these are the things that I like to, to have as takeaways in this process. This is, a, and you've heard some of this from, from Sheikh Yusuf. It's business. It's just business. It's principled business. You know, it's ethically oriented business, but it's business. And it's a business within a legal framework that's very old, 1,400 years. And quite complete. Excellent. The slides are also on our website. Just let people know that. Okay. Thanks. The slides are on the website. He said to mention to you. Um, it's structured finance, and by that I mean, uh, prior to that term was used, the time that term was usurped by derivatives folks. You know, these transactions are structured to allocate risks to the person most capable of of bearing that risk and managing that risk. So we'll look at some structures as you go along through here. And you'll see it's very similar to conventional Western finance in lots of ways. Uh, the, the similarities are greater than the differences. Very notable. And I think the uh, takeaway is that it gives you a competitive edge in business and it's quite rewarding culturally and intellectually uh, as a process. So just kind of to give you my background, I, I lived in Saudi from 96 to 2000. I uh, was a partner that managed uh, offices in the Middle East. I did project financing work. And the way I got into this field, I'll go through with you just a little bit because it's the, the story is relevant to what we do and how we practice and how this industry is growing. Uh, mostly I represent people from the Middle East, institutions, families that invest in the U.S. or Europe. Um, part of the bio that's a little inaccurate is that I just moved to Dubai uh, a few weeks ago and will be there probably six or eight months, depends, to work on some projects. So I began working in 1996, really in this area, uh, knowing nothing about it whatsoever. And the way I got into it is camels and petrochemicals, really. I uh, represented a bank, a group of banks, big international banks, mostly London-based, on the first project financing done in Saudi Arabia, which was a petrochemical project. And of course, when we started this, we went into Saudi and said, here's how you do a project financing in the US or Europe. How do you do it here? Can't be done. We broke that down into about that structure, into about 3,000 questions, little pieces. Translated them all into Arabic, tried to build little pieces of the model. Can't do it. So one of my partners is a very eminent uh, lawyer in the Middle East, got a judge from the Board of Grievances, which is a Sharia court in Saudi, to come talk to me, say, from 9 to midnight, two, three days a week. And during the course of that, I started reading everything I could find on the Sharia, the Quran, what have you, all related topics. And I asked him at one point, if I made a non-interest bearing loan or had a lease arrangement with you, Sharia compliant debt, could I take your camel as collateral security for this? You know, my, uh, this is a large petrochemical financing. The banks I re represent want a mortgage. They don't record mortgages in Saudi because the mortgage probably secures an interest-bearing obligation. Well, his response was, of course, you can do that. So I spent a year and a half talking to this guy about camels. You know, what's the basic principle of my getting a security interest? Can I milk the camel? Can I sell the milk? What do I do with the proceeds? What if it has a calf? You know, who takes care? I know a lot about camels. <laughs> now, I'm struggling to teach this fellow something because it's all one way. So I ask you this, just, 
Do you know how a camel stores water? Anybody? I succeeded in teaching him something here. It's not in the hump, the hump's all fat. It's the most remarkable thing. The, next to a whale, the camel has the most distensible red blood cell that there is in the world. So when a camel drinks all that water that you hear about, it goes into the red blood cells throughout the body. Brilliant. Physiologically brilliant because then by osmosis, it comes out where it, in whatever part of the body is dry. It's really brilliant. <coughs> At any rate, we go on and eventually, of course, he points out to me that there's a concept of collateral security that's 1,400 years old. People have been doing business for a long, long time, and it's not much different than how we do business. So we built a structure, and that structure is still used to obtain collateral security interests in places like Saudi, where the Sharia is the paramount law of the land. So a few points on that. It's about business, and the business is the same, and people have been doing business that way for a long, long time. Every concept that you can think of in business terms is covered by the Sharia, and it's quite similar. Leasing, partnerships, sales, and if you, if you take a look at law generally, partnership and trading, think of how business was conducted in the Arabian Peninsula 1,400 years ago. It's about trading. It's about partnerships. Some of the partnerships are with people you know well. Some of them are with people a long way away. India, if you're transporting from India into Europe, across the peninsula. So the, the basic business principles are the same. The difference, as Sheikh Yusuf points out, is there's an ethical element. You can't do certain kinds of business. Alcohol, pork, interest-based banking, things that you hear of. <clears throat> but it's otherwise quite similar. There are some differences. There are very important differences. But those are small, relatively, in the greater scheme of things. The legal system is 1,400 years old. For those of you who ever look at comparative legal studies, the partnership law of the Sharia is probably the most advanced in the world. Sales, trading concepts, terribly, terribly advanced. This has been developing a long time. Now, as, as Yusuf mentioned, there was a long period. There were no scholars in the 90s, in the 70s. When, why? Mostly English and American economic imperialism. Uh, we took the Sharia out of commerce and finance for five or six centuries, whatever the period is. <clears throat> the Sharia was practiced in the areas of family law, inheritance, and of course the English courts enforced that, say in India. But there was no Sharia. So if you're a young scholar, what future do you have going into Sharia as it's applied in commerce and finance in that period? None. So there's a reason there weren't so many scholars in the 70s. <coughs> so, as you have noted, there's a different risk-reward paradigm in many ways. What's valued here is partnership, risk-sharing, non-preference situations. One of the problems with bank lending is there's a distinct preference to the bank. They get paid first, as we well know. Well, that doesn't work so well. It's asset-based finance. So buying and selling paper or money or things that aren't tied to assets is not good. It's not permitted. Uh, but of course, you want to realize the same returns. And the investment funds that we'll talk about here, they want the same returns as you get in a conventional deal. That's difficult to do because we're developing products for the first time. And they're a little more complex in some ways. There's a little more structuring than there is in a conventional deal. So your transactional costs are a little higher. And we spend a lot of time trying to drive down the transactional costs so that Islamic finance is competitive. And of course, we do use leverage, hearing concepts. And we'll look at an example in particular to show how that's done. Three themes to kind of keep in your head. 
And these, oh, Shaky Yusuf referenced all of these. The nominate contracts, these accepted structures over the centuries. In the mid-1990s, you were still looking at that, those contracts, and we still do. They still drive the process in many ways. They were silos. You had to get your deal right into that silo or it wasn't compliant. What happened in the mid-1990s, as you just mentioned, you started to think of them as building blocks. You combine them, you still have to satisfy them all, but you combine them in a transaction. Instead of having just one, you'll have multiple contract arrangements, or contracts isn't really the term. Some of them are structural uh, transactional forms, if you will. There is some degree of permissible variance that was institutionalized in the Dow Jones Fatwa that was referred to here, 1998. Very young, this is only 11 years ago. Uh, there's some cleansing and purification and these things, it's not like they appeared in 1998, but they were institutionalized at that time. And they've had a profound effect on the developing a very, the practical approach in Islamic finance <laughs> and capital markets developments. Equity markets, 1998, Dow Jones. Well, that's not so long ago. 2003 for the finance side with the Sukuk. And we'll come back to that. But that gives you an indication of how young and undeveloped, how much we're at the very beginning of this process in developing a whole capital markets system if you will. And think of, particularly in these times, what would you do differently to develop your capital markets? Of course, in part, we look to securitizations. Uh, they're very effective in risk allocation and whatnot. Subprime issues aside, but, and of course the scholars, Sharia scholars, are integral to everything. Consensus is defined these days as a consensus of those scholars and how they interpret principles uh, in light of these modern transactions. So the nominate contracts, very briefly, covered all kinds of things. Transactional forms, leasing, very importantly, partnerships, uh, marabahas, sale at a markup, musharakas, although the term is more recent, uh, is a type of partnership. But uh, the whole range of very, very well-developed partnership concepts. Um, and as I say, in the 1990s, the thought, mid-1990s, was let's combine them in different ways. And I'll show you an example of a situation in which they're combined in different ways that could not have existed uh, had these develop developments not come along. The Dow Jones Fatwa. Think of this. Before 1998, and this is a little extreme in the characterization, but not really. Before 1998, if you were a Sharia-compliant investor, a devout Muslim, you couldn't buy a share of stock, basically anywhere in the world, because every company pays or receives interest. You couldn't buy it. So what happened? Dow Jones said, the fatwa said, we're going to allow a little bit of variance on that. We're going to allow you to buy equities as long as there's not too much interest. And of course, it's both interest expense and interest income. So this, you know, thinking of how this industry grows, there's an, it's not extreme. It's compromised in some cir circumstances, at least temporarily. Uh, I hadn't thought of this today, but the only extremism is Sheikh Yusuf, his adamant belief in the, in the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> he can't help it, you know, it's just... Uh, but otherwise, it's a very practical accommodation to the world. You're trying to build a whole industry and a whole market. So there are quite a few different areas in which you accept something temporarily. And over time, it gets closed down a little bit, as you can, as a real-life practical matter. And you'll see lots of examples of that. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's one of those things that people talk about whether it should happen or not, but it does. I think it should, personally, and I think you wouldn't have an industry without it. Basically, the Dow Jones tests are these. Is the instrument prohibited? 
If it's not, you know, we'll look at that very briefly. Um, is it a permissible business? Does that company conduct a permissible business? And third, there's some financial ratios to go, that go to the degree of interest, income, and expense. They illustrate some things. Fixed income instruments, preferred shares, etc. Why are they prohibited? Because somebody gets a preference on a preferential reward or payment out of the operation. It's not a partnership in a pure concept. And that's a simplistic explanation, but that's the concept. You're guaranteeing somebody's capital or assuring it or giving them a preference of some sort. And that's not what the Sharia is about. The prohibited business activities you're familiar with on the whole, pork, alcohol, etc. The hard part in modern times is, and this is the word core up there, what do you do about GE or Ford or any other company that has more than one business in its overall unit? GE has a finance company, Ford, GM. I mean, so you start thinking about how businesses are put together. And if you're going to say, okay, you can't do any business with GE, you can't own GE stock because somewhere in there is GE capital or Ford because they finance the purchase of their vehicles. Now, it's not that simple, of course. You've got to sit down and say, has the capital company become so big that essentially the whole business is GE capital? So it's a kind of complex analysis. Uh, the principles are fairly straightforward, not entirely. Dow Jones pro prohibition on entertainment. Is it really all entertainment? Any type? No. But it's hard to differentiate whether somebody's producing inappropriate films or contributions to inappropriate industries. So they, they exclude it all. Much easier as a practical matter. So a lot of these principles are practical applications over and over and over. The financial test. Let's look only at the second one. Is from that fatwa is total debt to market cap. Now remember that this test was developed at a time when all you had was balance sheet information. You didn't really have operating statements. It, there, I personally think there's an easier and better way to do this. Now, if you can get operating statements, why not look at actual in income? interest income and interest expense. But this is the test. And it's been interesting to see how it works from 1998 to now. Through the dot-com period, you know, through interest rate movement periods, it's not perfect. It's pretty good though, not too bad. But the point is, you're going to allow some interest. This is how they estimated interest. Sheikh Yusuf is on this board, by the way, so you can uh, harass him about the, the exact economics of this test. But, so the important, important point is that variance. And this has allowed this industry to grow in many ways. Current markets. As noted here, it's 1996 or thereabouts to the present. A lot of the structures that are used in big sophisticated financings private equity, real estate, projects, infrastructure around the world were actually developed in the United States, oddly enough. The reason for that is that we are, as a tax matter and in many other areas, a substance over form jurisdiction. So you have something, the concept of disregarded entities for tax. There's a lot of flexibility in our legal system and our business system in terms of being able to adapt to the Sharia. England spent a lot of time and money. They're not a, a, a substance over form jurisdiction. So if you have an entity in, in the UK, and this is true throughout Europe, it's true through most of the Middle East, it's taxable. We have lots of them that aren't, that you can put in for other purposes. And despite the bad name that comes out to given to special purpose entities post Enron, there are lots of great, very legitimate uses of special purpose entities. Bankruptcy, remoteness, you know, containing liabilities of different sorts, 
You can't do that in, in many jurisdictions without a tax penalty. The tax people wouldn't call it a penalty, of course. That's my view. Um, so the first structures were in roughly 2000. Um, what was going on there? Residential real estate in the United States was developing pretty rapidly at that time. Multifamily housing, condominium, then post-hurricanes there was even more condominium. Middle Eastern investors have a lot of familiarity with real estate, which you can think of for historical reasons. You didn't have a lot of other assets. It was an important asset. And they know a lot about it. So it made sense. Um, Europe was 2003 and thereafter, and then other, other jurisdictions, even Dubai, for example, was, it was subsequent to that period. We began with residential properties. Part of that is because of the prohibited business rules. When you're looking at individuals, you don't police them. If they want to drink alcohol in their home, it's not an issue, but you can't rent to Seagram's. So a lot of the early transactions were re focused on residential. It made things easier. Dow Jones only came down in 1998, so you didn't know how the variance principles were going to be applied. In around 2000, we started doing uh, commercial properties. Uh, the first deals, funds were focused on single tenant credit lease properties. One tenant, investment grade credit minimize the same problem and others. Um, thereafter, as the principles grew, uh, those, the application of those principles from Dow Jones, those variants, we went into many other multi-tenant uh, multi situations. Uh, shopping centers that sell pork and alcohol. The first one was actually an ATM a building that was otherwise Sharia compliant, but there was an ATM in there owned by an interest-based bank. Well, it's a small footage, it's a small rent, you know, it's serving a, a, a retail population, and the scholar said, that's okay, we'll allow that. Well, what do you do? A restaurant that serves alcohol. Now, you can imagine the number of issues that these scholars deal with in this every day. And in some cases, they just say it's okay. In others, they say, all right, figure out how much of the profit of that tenant is attributable to, say, alcohol, that restaurant. And you can get that using industry figures because, of course, your, your tenant isn't going to tell you. Um, but you can estimate, and you can estimate pretty closely. So a portion of the profit on the rent that we get into the Sharia compliant fund is donated to charity. You know, we can't use the alcohol. Well, it's a little removed, but it's an effort. We try and, and affect the principle. Pardon me. <clears throat> now, all kinds of funds. Exchange traded funds, bankruptcy distressed desk funds, you know, tracking funds of different sorts. Um, derivatives, as, as you mentioned, there are essentially none. There are some efforts. Some of the constraints, no short-term instruments to speak of other than Marabaha transactions, the London Metals Exchange reference here, uh, which is, in my view, a sham. It's the only way we can do it, but it's a loan. And it's acceptable for now. Now, the scholars have put the world on notice that you've got to find a different way to do this over time. We're going to allow it for now because that's how working capital financing is done. There are lots of other instruments. But, so it's, we're going to permit it for a while, not forever. No secondary markets to speak of. Okay, let's look at a few structures. This is 1999. The first bank in the United States to do one of these transactions was Key Bank. And we went to Key Bank with a residential deal. It was about $30 million or so. Very small transaction. And said, we'd like to have you do a Sharia compliant financing. Right. You can imagine. Nobody knew what it was. And their argument is, I'm unfamiliar. I don't know what this is. What do I have to do? I have credit committees, I have underwriting committees, I got regulatory concerns, I got tax issues, I don't want to be bothered with a $30 million transaction. <clears throat> but they did it. Now, part of the way they did it was we had to develop 
what I refer to as a bifurcated structure there. Basically, we had to say to them, look, we're going to develop a structure that's Sharia compliant and we'll worry about that, but you don't have to change anything. And it's going to be similar enough to what you do as a day-to-day -day matter that you can accept it, that you understand it. So what would you use? A lease. You know, in the United States, every aircraft, every piece of medical equipment, power plants, you name it, they're leverage leased. It's, the banks know all about leverage leasing and finance leasing. It's also a nominate contract that's very well accepted, very well defined. We understand the rules. And frankly, it's quite similar. Everything to the left of that line is not compliant with the Sharia. Everything to the right is compliant. The funding company is the SPV that I referred to that we put in every deal. The project company is all this stuff over on the right. The project company is the, and the fund are all Sharia compliant vehicles. The important portion is here, this company, which is owned by a third party, buys the asset. Whether it's a private equity deal, a real estate deal, doesn't matter. Project financing. They buy some or all of the assets, and they lease them to the project company. Then what happens, and the funding company takes a conventional loan that is exactly the same loan as that bank makes every other day of its existence. They don't have to change anything. And the asset is going to be in that funding company, so they're going to be comfortable. They can grab it. If there's a default, they foreclose on their mortgage. They lease it over to this project company. We sublease it or we sell products or whatever. I take a, a lease here, but a real estate deal, but it doesn't matter. Same thing. Tenant pays rent. We take off exactly enough rent to pay the debt service to the penny. There's not one penny left in that funding company. Only in the United States can you do that. Exactly. Why? Because the rent is, is taxable income to, in any other jurisdiction. And you start getting all kinds of problems. You've got to pay taxes. You've got to get money in there to pay taxes, etc. So in the U.S., this works perfectly. And of course, we figured out how to do this structure in a tax-efficient manner in over 30 other countries. So, you know, you get there over time. All the rest of the money goes out to the fund. What's left of the tenant's rent, and of course, after reserves and operating expenses and all that sort of thing. But this structure is used in every, virtually every jurisdiction that we've ever done a deal. Korea, Japan, you know, Portugal, you name it. Middle Eastern jurisdictions, some variant of this structure. It's one of the two ways in which home finance is done. Uh, you know, Sharia compliant home financing. Whoops. That's not so great. Um, in that case, a bank or a funding company will take the asset, the home, and lease it to the person who's being financed. Same thing. Now there are complexities because banks can't own real estate. And, but that's grist for lawyers. You know, that's how I make a living. <laughs> we get over all that stuff. <laughs> Um, there are a couple others. There's a put on the property and a call. This is to illustrate kind of some of the Sharia principles. Uh, you cannot collect advance rents under a lease, Sharia compliant lease, if you terminate the lease. Well, think of real estate financings. They're almost all bullets, right? Interest only, principal due on the last day of the term, five years out. What, and, and in most jurisdictions, in foreclosing on a mortgage, you either wipe out the lease automatically or you're going to terminate it. So if you do that, how's the bank get their principal back? Not a good result if they can't get their principal back. And you'd be surprised, sometimes I review uh, transactions for S&P in particular, but different rating agencies. Somebody will think they don't need this next agreement. And you sit down and say to them, well, how does the bank get paid at the end of the day when you terminate that lease? Very important. Um, 
This, what will happen is the bank will direct the funding company to put the whole asset, the building, the plane, whatever it is, basically to put it to the project company for a strike price equal to the outstanding indebtedness to the penny. Now, it's not really a put. It's a Sharia compliant sale and purchase agreement. But for analysis purposes here, you excel, when you accelerate the loan, it's automatically, the asset is put. If the borrower, so-called, can pay it, the project company, they get title. Well, that's unlikely in a default, but there are lots of other situations where it happens. Similarly, and this is the last portion, if I'm the project company, I want to sell my asset to a third party, I have to be able to call it. So now you've got different nominate contract concepts working together instead of just one. Well, when you get done with this, it works economically the same way a loan financing with a few little exceptions. Late payment interest, you can't do. Uh, default interest, you can't do. There are a few situations like that. We'll do one more structure. Just, this is the second way you do home financings. And it's a very popular structure. The first one I know of, of this type was 1997 in Saudi for uh, some assets, tra electric transmission assets. Um, and there we didn't have an issuer and holders. We had a, three banks. Doesn't matter. I use this because Sukuk. This is to illustrate that Sukuk can be used. Bonds or securitizations can be used here as well. A Musharka is just a partnership. A Marabaha is a sale of something at a markup. What you're going to sell here are hissas, or partnership interests. So, like any financing, the bank gets a bunch of money. So here the issuer is going to get money by selling a bond or a securitization instrument. That issuer will hold the money, but it'll say to the project company, look, you're going to build this thing in reality. You know, this is Saudi Electric Company, Skiko Central at that time. You're going to build this. You put some assets, put some equity into your deal. So the project company will put some equity in, and it'll get partnership interests back. Monthly, as you're going through construction, just like any other construction deal, the bank will fund the, the cost of that month. And every month they'll get some more partnership interests. So that'll go on until you're done. The conditions to doing that, you can imagine, they're the same as any other financing, construction financing that you've ever seen, with very small differences. But it's the same. So now, basically, the bank or the issuer controls all the finances in the deal. The project company controls all the construction. What's the difference, economically, between this arrangement and a con conventional construction financing? Remarkably little. How do you repay this? Tenant, I show again, but uh, there it was sale of electricity, it could be sale of oil, whatever it is. Tenant pays their rent, project company makes a payment to the issuer, and the issuer sells partnership interests to the project company. And that money is used to pay off the debt. And that goes on every month. Same amount of home purchase. So at the end of the deal, you own your own property. You financed it, you got it back. These are not terribly complicated, they're structured. This is the same as doing a conventional financial deal, economically and, and oddly enough in many other ways. Final topic, Sukuk. This is the capital markets. It was mentioned it really only began in 2003. <clears throat> there are of two types, what are referred to as bonds. They aren't really bonds. They're, if you, for those of you who think about finance at all, they're much more akin to whole business securitizations uh, because they don't have the same preferential rights as bonds etc. And the others are true asset securitization structures of different types. Most of them are bond structures, you know, whole business securitization structures. Most have sovereign credits. There are some few corporate issuances. That market is just starting to develop. There's only been one and possibly two 
That's asset securitizations. I happen to live in a house in Dubai that's in that securitization, which is surprising to me. But uh, I moved there two weeks ago and found out that this house, it's a villa out on the Palm Island, um, went into the securitization. This, as you have said, in one couple hours or a day at the most, you trade more in a conventional market than have been done in the whole history of Islamic finance. It's 87.955 billion as of August 14th of this year. And I imagine given the financial conditions since, there aren't many more since then. So these numbers are pretty close. Interesting, by volume and by issuances, Malaysia, Bahrain predominate overwhelmingly these markets. I'll give you some figures. We won't go through this obviously, but this, if you look at the slides, will give you an, ind an indication of where these come from, what industries. This is the only study I know that's ever been done like this. I did this with another guy uh, who's an executive vice president of a big Sharia compliant fund. Um, and this was accurate information, statistically accurate, as of August 14th. There may be some small variances, but try and figure out how much is sovereign. Try and figure out from this, you know, how much is uh, infrastructure financing. It's really hard to do. The data isn't particularly good. But you get some idea of where the issuances are. Financial services industry has eaten up the world in this. But there are a number of other good ones. Like look at the number of issuances in agriculture. 52 inches. Well, they're trying to promote agriculture in various places in the world. This will give you an indication of different structures that are used in different years. Um, the tenors. There are a lot of seemingly a lot of short term. They're all of one structure. And they're all issued by one entity in, in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Very little in terms of long-term debt. It's really hard to finance short-term and long-term in this business. Now, of course, you can't finance at all. But So it's a business. It's growing rapidly. OIC jurisdictions are, <coughs> pardon me, the, the areas of greatest population growth in the world. And most importantly, the areas of great, greatest urbanization. Streets, roads, water, you know, think of what comes along and think of in infrastructure needs as a result and what's going to happen to Islamic finance. These jurisdictions are frequently Muslim jurisdictions and those governments have said we would like, it's not mandated as a legal matter, but we would like part of every deal to be Sharia compliant, one tranche. Uh, those are some separate issues, but you're going to see them. Um, the legal framework needs some reform in many jurisdictions, but the jurisdictions are trying in many of them, so not all. There's some, not as much certainty, and predictability in the legal structure as you get in New York law or whatever, uh, English law. So most of the deals use English law or New York law, where you can use it. Can't use it in anything. The financial centers adopt those models because of that. You know, DIFC, Kuwait, uh, Qatar Financial Center, what have you. Problem is you have no experience with them. You don't know what they're going to do. Structured finance, as you see, uh, gives you a competitive edge, I, I believe. I've seen lots of transactions in which bidders, uh, the bid went to somebody who volunteered to do the transaction in a Sharia compliant way. You're seeing it more in the aircraft industry, the oil and gas industry, uh, construction arrangements, project financings of all type. It's enriching. It requires a great deal of mutual understanding, but we've done, think of this, over 300 banks in the United States have done these transactions now. You know, a lot of them are Roseville Bank and Trust. Some of them are very small because they're construction lenders on multifamily in their own home jurisdiction. Some of them are quite large. Today, I'll close three of these, that lease structure, uh, with a huge bank, you know, one of the two largest banks in the U.S., and they do a lot of them. 
So that's it, and I would like to again thank the sponsors and thank you for being here. Thank you both. Thank you both. Uh, we distributed cards upon which uh, people could uh, write their questions, and uh, we have uh, some fantastic ones here. And what I would propose to do is, is read them uh, uh, very quickly so that the audience and the speakers alike can uh, have the adrenaline to begin thinking of what their response uh, to these questions uh, might be. Uh, but before doing so, I wanted to recognize uh, His uh, Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdulaziz uh, bin Talal Al Saud, uh, who's here as one of our honored guests, uh, uh, Prince Abdulaziz, right here in the front. Here are uh, amongst the, the questions here. Uh, does Islamic banking really depend on the principle of full reserve banking? Did this principle in any way uh, help to insulate Islamic banks from the current economic crisis? Would economic growth be possible in a truly full reserve uh, system? If so, second one, if social justice is one of the goals of Islamic finance, then why do Islamic societies seem to do no better at dealing with poverty than any other cultural or economic system? Uh, is the Islamic finance phenomenon simply a religious cultural quirk, or is it truly a different, more efficient, and less risk-prone financial system than the financial systems prevailing in other parts of the world? Fourth, uh, there's always concern about terrorist funding uh, whenever the term Islamic finance is used. Is there anything inherent in the basic principles of Islamic finance that makes it any more or less susceptible to use and abuse by terrorists attempting to transfer funds? What is the appeal of Islamic finance in Sharia, Sharia to non-believers, especially agnostics, atheists, and secularists? Uh, if interest is taboo, are options, futures, puts, calls, guarantees, and credit insurance uh, Sharia compliant? Uh, is asset securitization uh, Sharia compliant? Some of these have been touched on, but uh, uh, we ask for uh, any further comments that you might uh, have here. Uh, yes. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf uh, and, and Mr. McMillan, uh, we see Islamic finance developing outside of Muslim countries. In your opinion, what are the possibilities of Islamic finance to develop in secular countries with predominantly Muslim population? For example, in the former Soviet countries where gov governments are quite Islamophobic. Uh, interesting. I'll, I'll stop here and then we'll run through these and uh, we can uh, ask as many of the others as possible. And forgive me if I try to fuse or amalgamate uh, uh, some of these uh, questions. Uh, we'll go then to the one of this, does Islamic banking really depend on the principle of full reserve uh, banking? And uh, did this principle in any way help to insulate Islamic banks from the current economic uh, crisis? E either or both. I, I find that a little difficult to answer. I'm, I'm not a banker uh, or an economist. Uh, full reserve banking, I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I, 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 we, we typically I, I design uh, reserves into uh, instruments like Sukuk, for example, as a credit enhancement. Um, uh, but I, I realize that the question is really for an economist, and uh, I, you know, I, 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 like I said, um, we cooperate and cannot exist without our conventional counterparts. And Michael illustrated some of that in detail with his with his uh, with his charts. So we are very much dependent upon uh, the the mainstream financial system. The question really would be. Uh, if the Sharia system were to insist on full reserves, 
then how would the economic of the system of the world be affected? Um, and I, I, I really can't answer that, I'm like, again, because I'm, I'm not an economist. Maybe I can say this. Banks, Islamic banks in all but I think one jurisdiction, but maybe all, are subject to the same regulatory requirements as a conventional bank. Um, so whatever the reserve requirements are for a conventional bank, the difficulty has been in true implementation, assessment of risk in an Islamic bank, because if you're truly implementing Sharia compliant structures, what happens is the money comes into the bank, they go out and as a partner, invest it in transactions. You know, they're doing partnerships with other people, they're doing investments that are Sharia compliant. Is the risk of that investment higher than buying T-bills or whatever, you know, whatever instrument you're gonna buy? Till September 14th, we might have said yes. Mm -hmm. September 4th, 14th onward, it's, you know, you have a different analysis. So that most of the debate on the reserve requirements in Islamic banking have focused on how you assess the risk of investment of that so-called deposit. It's not a deposit for a Sharia purpose, by the way, except in like the UK insisted that it be a deposit. The U.S. would probably now do the same, but and it be subject to uh, deposit insurance, et cetera. But in reality, from a Sharia point of view, the money comes in, it's a mudarba, usually. The money, it's a partnership in which the depositors are the people, partners contributing the money, and who's ever running the bank or the bank is a partner who donates services. That is, they invest the money. And that is a little different analysis in some ways. It's the same in others. Yeah, let me add also that we've, uh, the industry has established its own uh, Islamic Financial Services Board. Uh, it's an international body. Uh, its membership includes um, all the major uh, banks, uh, central banks, state banks of, of Muslim OIC countries, and includes the IMF and the World Bank and many other central banks as well. And what uh, they're doing is uh, is attempting to um, uh, to um, communicate really to the rest of the world exactly what what our requirements, special requirements are, and, and to to uh, explain to, to to bankers around the world exactly how, you know what what kind of special circumstances we deal in. Uh, so I, I, I think that the industry is, has, has probably a long way to go. Nonetheless, we have taken the first steps toward uh, um, interfacing, let's say. We have a lot of questions, to put it mildly. Uh, as therefore, I'll ask our speakers uh, not to do injustice to the thoughts and the uh, substance of the questions, uh, but I would like to get as many uh, asked and responded to as possible, and if it's uh, unsatisfactory to the person who asked it, come up afterwards and, and speak with the speakers uh, person to person. If social justice is one of the goals of Islamic finance, then why do Islamic societies seem to do no better at dealing with poverty than any other cultural or economic system? Let me take this one. Um, Obviously, uh, injustice is, 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 is a part of the, the way that the, the world operates. Uh, uh, people, uh, every, uh, every few years, someone comes along with a, with a great idea, whether he's a politician or a, or a, or a, or a preacher or, or who knows what. Uh, the question is, you know, just exactly how do those ideas get implemented? Um, we're human. Everyone tries to do their best, uh, you know, the, 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 we, we have a new administration here in the U.S. and everyone has high hopes for, uh, for, 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 for uh, you know, social justice here in the U.S. But it's the same situation around the world. You have uh, principles uh, that uh, everyone believes in, but when it comes to implementing and, and actually bringing this uh, to fruition, uh, we're all in the same boat. We, we all do our best. We feel that, uh, 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 however, in, in Islamic finance, that we, um, we we started out with a with an ideal set of principles, and we're we're a, a relatively new industry. We're doing our best. We've undoubtedly made mistakes along the way, and we'll continue to make them. Nonetheless, uh, the, the real focus of the of the financial industry is 
or, or, or let's say part of the focus <coughs> of that growing industry is on uh, I improving, uh, Im improving the, the lot of people. And uh, that, that's significant that as a primary premise that uh, a system actually uh, includes that in, 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 in what it, as, as a part of what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, what role did the irresponsible use of interest, RUBBA, uh, play in the current U.S. financial crisis? <laughs> I, uh, I alluded in my talk to, to some fundamentals. Uh, I, I think that, uh, it, it, you know, the, it, that's a huge question to answer, obviously. But uh, did it play a part? Yes, it did. because. Interest is something used to, where, where, where money makes money. And that's not real. In other words, what makes money is business. Business makes money, real business. Things that you can touch and feel and that make a difference in the world. That's, that's, that's what ultimately makes money in the sense of value, okay? Money is, currency is a measure of value. It's not value in and of itself. So there's a fundamental lesson, I think, here, and, and we've, 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 uh, we, we've come up with incredibly uh, clever ways to make money out of nothing, and we've allowed it to flourish, uh, and, and it, it hasn't done us any, any good at all. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you, all right. Next one. Uh, you mentioned that uh, many Islamic financial projects are dependent on conventional forms of credit. To what extent, then, is Islamic finance a true alternative to conventional finance? And to what extent is it more of a complement to the conventional interest-based paradigm? Well, these transactions, a lot of them are quite large, and you can't do them without a large number of financiers. If you look at transactions in the Middle East, let's begin with those. Could you do them in a purely Sharia-compliant way? The answer is yes, we've done some. Depends on the, on the size uh, and people's diversification desires and the Saudi banks, you know, in their transactions. You want regional banks, you want international banks. Very few of them are Sharia compliant outside the Middle East, Malaysia, Indonesia. And none in Indonesia, frankly. Um, all of these, in terms of risk spreading, risk diversification, virtually all of the transactions involve a broad spectrum of banks. Up until quite recently, the, the JP Morgan Chase, and I don't mean to pick on them, Citibank, whoever, were not willing to do um, Sharia compliant deals, purely Sharia compliant deals. They're not familiar with them, as familiar. They wanted English law or New York law on a loan agreement that they understood. And from, an ob, you know, in terms of their obligations to their shareholders, it's probably the right decision. So the transactions get structured as multi-tranche. Part of it is Sharia compliant, part is not. There are a large number of those and an increasing number of those. They're also internally in jurisdictions that enforce the Sharia to some greater or lesser extent, purely Sharia compliant deals, transactions. It's a growing segment. I'm going to make an observation back to my little example, example of the camels. One of the way we got there is that we talked to judges about here's a, a U.S. or U.K. structure. If it went into a court in Saudi, how are you going to enforce it? What's, and we gave them questions, all kinds of examples. There was very little certainty correlation between the determinations of the different judges, as you might expect. When we struck structured the example as Sharia compliant and had, you know, fact scenarios, the consistency and predictability was very, very high. So the fears of the bankers, one of the reasons that deal got done is the bankers began to say, well, what I really care about is certainty and predictability. As long as I know what the outcome is going to be, I can price, I can, you know, structure, I can do whatever. So they did those deals. Now, Saudi's a little bit easier because it's Hanbali school, it's one school. Many other jurisdictions, you don't know which school of Islamic jurisprudence is going to be applied in a court. You know, it's more complex. 
Saudi's actually a good case it's a, because it's one school. But so there are a lot of factors like that that influence, you know, how you structure these deals, how the banks structure them and go into them. It's not a direct, perfect answer, but. Okay. Um, this, uh, two questions fused into one. What are the regulatory barriers to establishing an Islamic bank in the United States? Uh, if any, what would be legislative action? In other words, how is Islamic finance currently regulated in the United States? <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, uh, is that the, uh, the Federal Reserve has established a, a, a working group, a study group that has, uh, for maybe the last four or five years, monitored Islamic finance around the world. They've attended conferences. Uh, representatives uh, of, of the bank have uh, spoken at, uh, at a number of affairs uh, and forums. And um, we're encouraged by their interest. And I, I, I was speaking, uh, you know, off camera with, 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 with one of their people, and he said to me, you know, we're, we're actually surprised that no one has applied for an Islamic banking license uh, here in the U.S. as yet. So there, you know, there, there's expectation that it will happen. I know that there are a couple of, uh, a couple of efforts underway in Canada, and um, uh, were it not for the political uncertainties of the last six months, they would probably already be up and running in Canada. Uh, but it'll, it'll happen here in the U.S. as well, uh, sooner or later, uh, I'm quite sure. And the last half of that, Islamic finance isn't regulated in the United States. It isn't regulated in most jurisdictions. There are a few, Malaysia, uh, for example, has a bifurcated regulatory system that's pretty interesting. But we don't regulate that way. We, we don't regulate, you know, our securities laws don't, all securities are the same. All banks are the same in the United States. And most regulators here in the banking sectors and the capital market sectors desire to proceed with that. Singapore is similar, you know, you go around the world, there is some movement, mostly in Middle Eastern jurisdictions and Southeast Asian jurisdictions, to regulate it a little differently. But not on matters of prudence, on the whole. The differences come in acknowledging that it's a little different risk structure. Well, how do you handle that in a securities offering? Usually disclosure is the, the way you handle it. The other way they focus has been, who is a Sharia scholar qualified to render a fatwa or an opinion on this structure. You know, so Malaysia has a, an approval system, if you will, for the central bank and for the Securities Commission. Is the instrument itself, do they have different standards, substantive standards? No, they don't, except where the, the instrument has a different risk profile. And then most systems don't try and do anything different on regulation. They try and make sure that there's disclosure. Um, question uh, having to do with uh, both of you mentioning in passing uh, that you do not shy away from certain opportunities that have a degree, uh, impl implication being a, a small degree, short degree of, uh, of interest uh, in companies uh, that are involved in Islamic uh, financing there, Dow Jones as well. The um, question is for quantity here. Is it an itty-bitty uh, interest rate, uh, teensy-weensy one? In terms of numbers, is it tinier than minuscule? In terms of uh, length, is it shorter than midgetary? <laughs> Who asked that? <laughs> uh, neat, neat person, uh, a professor, uh, uh, Ustaz. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. The, um, basically, the, the, the simple principle is this, that um, if you can quantify the amount of impure income, let's call it impure in income, then you can, uh, at the other end, <coughs> give that uh, a commensurate amount away in charity and, and thereby purify the mm. investment or the portfolio. That's the principle. Obviously, the amounts uh, need to be regulated. I mean, uh, there need to be, to be limits on those amounts. And, and yes, minuscule. Uh, at one time, the, the original fatwa for Dow Jones said that it had to be less than 5%. Uh, 
um, we changed that because the people came to us and said, well, if you're allowing 5% on, on, uh, on, on investments in the stock market, then I just got an offer from my bank for a, for a CD that pays 4.7% over the next six months. So can I use that? Well, no, that's not the idea. Um, you know, so we, we, uh, we, we've had to modify that, the way that we express that somewhat. Okay. The uh, program notes uh, for this event uh, refer to, quote, a ban on uncertainty, quote, as a principle of Sharia. Yet, quote, risk sharing, quote, is another principle. Please explain what is meant by uncertainty in this context if it is not risk. Gar expert here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a reference to something called gharar, uh, which is, uh, Translated variously, some people say excessive risk. Um, I, I think the best translation is um, ambiguity in legal or contractual terms. Um, but essentially, uh, it, all business is risk. You, there's no progress. Uh, humans would never progress if they never took risks. Um, so risk is a part of everyday life. Um, we've learned over the centuries uh, how to manage risk. Um, sometimes we do it fairly well and sometimes we don't, like recently. Um, so, uh, you know, elaborate mathematical models have been developed for the management of, of risk in, in finance and um, uh, elaborate uh, state institutions have been established in the form of regulatory bodies for the management of risk. But it's a part of business. What the prohibition is about is essentially the kind of risk that goes way beyond, like the kind of risk in, in, a, in a toss of a coin, uh, or, or the kind of risk that's, um, uh, well, the classical uh, jurists give the example of throwing the net in the water uh, for, for, uh, for a certain amount of money, and then uh, saying that whatever the net brings in whatever fish come in are yours for that for this amount of money well you need to specify what you're selling so that's an ambigu an ambiguity an ambiguous situation in one of the contractual terms that's really what the prohibition is about mike i think this one's for you uh, where can i find the names of of those uh, ba these banks that participate in islamic finance on the subprime level and, and related to this how many Sharia banks, uh, Sharia banks are there? And when all of the uh, current uh, sh uh, Sharia, Sharia banks uh, initially established, were all of the uh, current uh, uh, Sharia banks initially established as Sharia banks, or did any non-Sharia banks change into Sharia banks? And since the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is known to be fairly strict about following uh, Sharia laws, then why aren't all of the banks in the Kingdom Sharia, or are they? Let's begin backwards. They are not. Mm -hmm. And in fact, under the banking law, there are no Islamic banks in Saudi. Mm -hmm. There are banks that practice Islamic finance in different ways, uh, Al Raji and National Commercial Bank and many others. NCB is converting many of their operations. But many countries do not have any, as a legal licensing matter, don't have any Islamic banks. Nonetheless, they have numerous banks that practice Islamic finance. And Citibank practices Islamic finance. You know, J.P. Morgan practices Islamic finance. Um, so it's not, it depends how you answer the, the question, depends a little bit about how you, well, let me say one of the things before I make that statement. Many banks had Islamic windows for a period of time. That is less and less fashionable. Um, it's difficult to affect both from the Sharia side and the regulatory side. Uh, it can be done, but there it's less frequent, I think, now than, than was the case. A lot of banks do Islamic banking or Sharia compliant banking uh, as an isolated matter. What were the other parts of this? I'm sorry. Uh, I think you covered them pretty well uh, there. I certainly uh, that was a three-part question. Um, of where can I find the names of those banks 
that participate in Islamic financing on the subprime level? I don't think any of them do on the subprime level that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, this one is back to one of the earlier ones. Uh, to what extent are non-Muslim individuals investing in Islamic-based financial mechanisms? What is the appeal of Islamic finance and Sharia to non-believers, specifically uh, agnostics, atheists, and secularists, especially uh, given one of the main themes in Islamic finance, uh, that it's rooted in notions of social justice. Can I try that as a first instance? Sure. Huh? Yeah. Um, to give you some indication of the Sukuk issuances that, that have sovereign credits, um, over the last, say, three years, about 40% of all the holders in the initial offering were non-Muslim institutions. Uh, the East Cameron Oil and Gas Sukuk, which is the, it's a Gulf of Mexico uh, oil and gas property is the only transaction that I'm aware of Islamic finance transaction to go into bankruptcy. Uh, we happen to represent the Sukuk holders on that. It's now 95% non-Sharia compliant investors. It's hedge funds own these instruments at this point. They owned 40% at the beginning and insur U.S. insurance companies. They go into them because they're good investments. They're well structured on the whole. This one has some problems. It has operating problems. It doesn't have any structural problems that led it into bankruptcy. It does have some structural problems because of the Sharia compliance structure after you're in bankruptcy. It's harder to get, the bankruptcy code is not built around uh, the concept of Islamic finance, so we're having a hard time working through uh, some of those. But that had nothing to do with it going into bankruptcy. Um, but people buy these because, well, they're ethical investments. Why do people buy? Why the University of Wisconsin or Berkeley or whoever go into ethical investing? You know, uh, Wafra, or, uh, Wharf, I'm sorry. Wafra is an institution in the Middle East. Wharf, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation years ago. They buy, you know, Lutheran funds, Catholic funds, Sharia compliant stuff. It's, the rules aren't much different, by the way, between the Lutheran funds and the Catholic funds on the one hand and the Sharia compliant funds on the other, with the exception of interest. Uh, but all the other ethical rules are quite similar. Let, let me add that the largest uh, US-based uh, Sharia compliant fund, the Amana funds, um, they estimate that probably 70% of their investors are non-Muslims because of the performance. They've won liberal awards for 10 years running. And low leverage. Some of them are pretty much lower leverage. And you made reference in passing to uh, energy companies, petrochemical countries, uh, companies and, uh, and banks that have been in this for a long time in terms of Islamic pro uh, finance for some of their projects. Uh, coming, and we have just three more questions here. Uh, does Islamic banking really depend on the principle of full reserve banking? Did this principle in any way help to insulate Islamic banks from the current yeah, economic crisis? Problem. Oh, you dealt with, I'm sorry, okay. I was thinking of 1929 and Roosevelt closing the banks and the uh, multiple uh, uh, loans uh, made uh, because, uh, despite uh, not full capitalization in the reserves. Uh, true or false, uh, uh, critics say that uh, Islamic... <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, true or false, uh, uh, critics say that Islamic finance was uh, a creation or inspiration or certainly heavily involved in, uh, uh, and led by members of the Ikhwan um, Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood. True, false? Uh, <laughs> or context, background perspective. Yeah, I, I, I think you know, my explanation of, of identity, uh, it's, it's been called identity politics by some cynical, um, you know, in any case, the, 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 the origins of modern Islamic finance go back to the 50s and 60s. Um, there was, uh, that was a highly politicized environment, uh, certainly, because why? Because people were just getting their independence and trying to figure out you know, how they, the direction that they were going to take for their countries. Uh, so uh, the Ikhwan Muslimun uh, had some comments. Uh, they, they, they wrote some papers, maybe a book or two on the subject, but to say that they had a hand in, in, in the shaping of modern Islamic finance is, is almost nonsensical. Can I comment on the terrorism point as well? Because just let's begin with what are the funds that are 
uh, have developed in the United States, for example, or Europe. Um, what's the average hold period on one of these funds at this point? You know, five to eight years? Not so, and both Yusuf and I have worked with the U.S. Treasury of a fair amount on this over time, uh, looking at some of these issues. What terrorist do you know that's going to lock up their money for eight years to start with? But there is all kinds of vetting through the process, all the know your customer sorts of OFAC vetting on every transaction. Uh, a lot of that is done by the largest real Sharia compliant real estate fund in the world is the HSBC Amana Global Properties Income Fund. That's who we're closing the three deals for today. We spent all day uh, Friday on OFAC stuff. HSBC as the placement agent does the same and, you know, investigation that it does on anybody else, any other type of transaction, cross-border transaction. Um, if you were to start to worry about it, it would be in more in day-to-day -day investment funds. We all worry about it, but if you're really going to focus on where money would go, it's not going into eight-year real estate. That, you know, it's going to go into some different type of investment. But in any case, it's a complete panoply and probably more sensitive than other industries given the public uh, viewing of this. We overcompensate on trying to do our uh, KYC. Mm -hmm. um, both of the uh, speakers uh, talked in terms of uh, some of the uh, categories of investment into which Islamic finance uh, is not directed. And they mentioned uh, gambling and uh, pornography and alcohol and uh, weapons uh, manufacturing they didn't mention but that's another one there and they uh, mentioned uh, entertainment industries but they weren't specific on this that is to say they uh, uh, with another concept they referred to uh, not investing in pork and they asked me to explain that this was of the animal kind, not the congressional kind, <laughs> that, uh, and, uh, which is manifested, researched, developed, uh, produced, and uh, disseminated, distributed up the street here. Um, uh, they also, I like the concept of saying that <laughs> the person paying it uh, sees it as a tax penalty, uh, but the IRS doesn't see it as a penalty. They see it perhaps as a reward. Um, and I like the allusion to the Boston Red Sox. My great uncle uh, played for the Red Sox in 1910, 1911, the year before Fenway Park was Excellent. built there. Uh, we're appreciative of Al Jazeera uh, filming this in Al Hura.